Connects Pro Networking Live Event. Now, this is an ongoing series designed to help green industry pros across the globe connect, share, and learn from each other. Tonight's session, we will focus on workplace safety. As a reminder, EchoMeansBusiness.com now in its sixth year is the premier online community and mobile app for the green industry. Visit the site or download the Echo Means Business mobile app to connect with pros like yourself or join one of the many conversations on tools or business tips. Access member rewards, listen to our podcast, or check out past pro networking videos. Tonight's guest, we have uh, lots of great people here. Lots of great people. We've got Sean Langton with Cujo Yardware. We have Troy Huber with Comfort Trim. And then we have Sam Steele with the NALP. For y'all that don't know what that means, that's the National Association of Landscape Professionals. So I'm going to just call on these guys. I'm going to let them tell you a little bit about their self, a little bit about what they do, and uh, then we will get into this. So if you have any well, questions, feel free to comment, and we will uh, try to get them up here and get your questions answered as well. So uh, let's start with Sam Steele here from the National Association of Landscape Professionals. Sam, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and exactly is what you do. Okay, thanks, Danny. Um, my name is Sam Steele, as you can see there on the screen. I'm the safety advisor for the uh, National Association of Landscape Professionals uh, in Fairfax, Virginia. I work from uh, my office in uh, at my home in from my college. And uh, what I do for the association and for our organization is uh, I'm really a member benefit. Uh, for NALP members who have questions about workplace safety, workplace safety and health. Uh, a lot of the questions I get asked uh, relate to OSHA regulations, which of the OSHA regulations apply to uh, lawn care firms, for example, which of the OSHA regulations apply to the construction side of the work that we do, the landscape construction design build companies. Um, I do get a lot of questions about safety committees and uh, uh, how you set up a safety committee and how the senior management can get behind that and make safety committees work. And then I talk a lot about kind of the, some of the things that OSHA is looking for in the industry. Uh, right now, OSHA is uh, very supportive of buddy systems. Uh, we're not the first industry to do that. Obviously, buddy systems have been around for a long time. But when you get new employees, a new season, a replacement employee, uh, OSHA thinks it's a great idea to have a buddy system set up. So that's kind of what I do. Um, I'm available pretty much 24 uh, seven to answer questions for our members and others that may eventually become new members of NALP. So I'll quit talking and let my other two uh, compatriots, th other three compatriots uh, tell a little bit about themselves. Yeah, we'll get into the uh, how to become a member and stuff because I'm sure there's a lot of people that are interested in and in how to do that. Uh, Sean Langton with Cujo Yardware, he, he's uh, he's knocking it out of the park um, from from uh, upgrading new shoes to going into composite toe boots and I mean just craziness. So Sean, tell us a little bit about yourself. It's craziness. How are we doing, Danny? Good to see you. Yeah, we uh, we got you to change, you know, switch out some of those New Balances and, and try out some Cujos a couple of years ago. That was a, that was my biggest accomplishment, actually. It was it was my K Swisses. Oh yeah, the K Swiss. That's K -Swisses. right. Swisses. <laughs> um, but no, uh, so uh, you know, Cujo Cujo Yardware. Um, you know, we started this three years ago, and we just wanted to create some footwear for the lawn care and landscaping industry. You know, that was our goal felt like uh, it was a, you know, you guys uh, haven't really been served with uh, footwear design specifically for what you do every day. And, you know, so I'm excited to be here to talk about, you know, safety, but overall, you know, we wanted to create something that, you know, maybe wasn't a heavy work boot. There are a lot of good work boots out there, but we wanted something different, maybe lighter, more comfortable, like a sneaker, but had a lot of the functionality that, that will keep workers safe when they're out there, you know, every day, hard at it. So, 
Um, it, it's been a fun couple of years. We learned a lot from just talking to lawn care and landscape guys. Literally every day we talk to guys and, and we get so much great feedback from people out in the field. And we just keep trying to, you know, make better products and footwear, you know, for, for all you, uh, you know, guys and girls out there working every day. All right. And now we have Troy Huber with Comfort Trim. Uh, Troy, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, thank you. Thanks, Danny. Uh, my name is Troy Huber, inventor of the Comfort Trim. Uh, a few years ago, I was in, in my yard just trimming my lawn, and I got tired of everything that that trimmer threw back at me. And I'm one of the seven out of 10 people that we did a survey on that uh, actually wore shorts because it's hot out. You know, who wants to wear jeans? Uh, not to, to mention, you know, that we have biting flies here in Southwest Kansas that is awful. And it just completely uh, fixed that. But anyway, uh, the the comfort dream. Yeah. Um, I also have a bag of upholstery. I've been I owned an upholstery shop for forty years, and I'm used to working with a lot of industrial materials or a lot of the industrial businesses we have here. And I thought one day I thought you know I I know how to sew. I've got I know all about these these materials, hundreds of different materials. So I kind of went to work. And I started making something that I thought would work. And I knew it had to be light. I knew I needed to come up with something that was durable. I knew I needed to, to come up with something that like professionals could wear all day long and, and, and not even know that they had them on. I uh, started coming up with some ideas. My first ones are of course too hot. Everybody's legs sweat. And then after that, uh, I started uh, a few of my guys that was testing them. I started using some mesh and some lighter weight materials. And before I knew it, uh, after a while, one of the guys said when I asked him to bring it in so I could uh, make some changes, he said, well, I could bring it in Friday evening, but I got to have it back on Monday morning. So that's when I kind of knew I had something. And uh, we just were, we're now we're just we're with them. And we're back. No, you did great. <clears throat> All right. So uh, we're going to start with some questions here, get into some conversation. If you have any questions you just joined recently, feel free to post some things over in the comments of what you would like to uh, ask any of these gentlemen. Maybe you got a questions for one of them specifically. So uh, let's jump into some questions here. Um, so let's talk about what are the local uh we're going to ask sam this and and because this is a big one to start the uh the, the thing off right i believe what are the local or federal regulations or requirements that green industry pros should be concerned with when it comes to workplace safety and what's the impact if any so generally speaking uh the osha regulations whether it's an OSHA, there's what's called an OSHA plan state. Those are states that OSHA has approved their OSHA workplace safety programs and plans. The one requirement OSHA has at the federal level is that if you're an OSHA plan state, and there's about 22 or 23 OSHA plan states out of the 50 states, that if you are an OSHA plan state, your OSHA regulations, your state OSHA regulations, like Cal OSHA, for example, Washington OSHA, the state of Washington, a lot of you've heard of Cal OSHA, so I use that as an example. What the federal OSHA people say is that those regulations have to be at least as stringent as the federal regulations. You can't set up your own state plan and have regulations that are a little easier to comply with. So anyway, any state OSHA plan has to be at least as rigorous and uh, as strict as the federal program. Uh, what I like to do when I'm talking to people about how OSHA impacts their business is that if you're a commercial lawn maintenance firm, most of the regulations you have to comply with are part of what's called the general industry standard. So if you were to go to www.osha.gov slash General, uh, the general industry regulations, most commercial and residential lawn care firms need to comply with those regulations. 
if you're a landscape construction firm, design, build, uh, do patio work, you do planting, that kind of uh, that kind of work in the green industry, then the construction, believe it or not, the construction safety regulations are the ones that generally you have to comply with. It's a little confusing when you get to things like the ladder safety fall prevention programs because both of those two regulations, the general industry and the construction, have their own little sections on ladders, for example, and that also creates a little confusion in some other areas. But that's how it's generally broken out. Uh, there are other regulations that some of the companies that are members of NALP and other landscape firms in the country uh, have to comply with the EPA's regulations on what's called the Worker Protection Standard, which is abbreviated WPS. So if, you're, if you do apply chemicals, let's say you're a lawn care firm, you have a licensed applicator and that individual is doing weed control on some of your contracted work, then you also have to comply with the EPA's worker protection standard. And that is usually administered by state EPA offices. Here in Pennsylvania, uh, our Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture and Land uh, Stewardship here in PA has a separate office that handles all of the state EPA regs. But what they're doing is they're just, they're providing the training, they're providing a lot of times the interpretation of the worker protection standard as it relates to Pennsylvania companies. So Danny, those are kind of the, the two parts of the regulations. They're, each one is like a phone book, unfortunately. And if you've ever looked at OSHA regs, you know that it's very thick. It can be a little bit compli uh, complicated. Uh, and oftentimes I get asked questions about those. So how does the respiratory standard apply? And for us in the landscape industry, especially those of you who do construction patio work, uh, you're probably aware of the crystalline silica dust type of, of thing that uh, is, is done and you have the respirable crystalline silica dust. OSHA is concerned about that. So it's a separate standard now. Uh, for those of you in the construction side, um, uh, there is work being done at Federal OSHA right now on a new standard on uh, skid steer loaders. Uh, it hasn't been passed. And I, as far as I know right now, it has not gone out for co uh, what's called public comment yet. Uh, but they've been working on that for a couple of years. So you might see that type of thing coming down the road. Uh, the reason why all these regulations apply to us is that when you look at the data year after year after year, unfortunately, the green industry has a fairly high rate of uh, worker fatalities uh, as far as the all what's called the all industry average for the whole country. Uh, we're unfortunately on the high end of that. And because of that, OSHA gives us some special attention from flipping mowers to i mean uh safety in the i mean you, we really don't think about it a lot when we're out there uh but you know i mean I, I stepped off the mower today and and the first thing i thought of was stay away from it even though i've disengaged the blades um because you you walk off and you get so comfortable around this equipment because you're with it every day and the the first time you actually get so I can't even think of the word I'm looking for, um, but you is when it's something's going to happen. You know, uh, my foot touches the edge of the the discharge chute, and that's where that blade's spinning, and boom. Um, so I mean, there's so much uh, hedge trimmers falling, and you know, just accidentally clipping your arm or something. I mean, there's so much in this industry that could go wrong, and we really don't think about it on a day-to-day -day basis um, because we're, we're doing it all the time and we get so used to it that, you know, uh, in a, in a split second, something could go wrong. Yeah. That's what uh, we, when, whenever I do OSHA training, we have an OSHA 10 hour course that's offered through NALP. And I talk about it as becoming complacent. You're so used to doing it. You do it every day and you get a little complacent and then you make a big mistake and uh, sometimes, unfortunately, you pay the price. But you're right, you mentioned uh, mower flip overs, uh, flipping over on top of individuals. That's the reason why most of the larger zero turn mowers now have roll bars on them or the rollover protective structure that we call ROPS. That's the reason why they're on there. And a lot of times 
uh, you see those ROPs in the folded down position and you see an individual on the machine uh, with the ROPs down and their shoulders and head are sticking above the top of the, the top of the ROPs arms. And if it flips over, it's going to most likely pin the individual underneath a 12, 1300 pound uh, zero turn mower. Right. Which and, ain't good. And so often in our industry, as, as all of you are probably aware, you do have individuals that are working by themselves at times, or they're out of sight of the other crew members and something happens and there's nobody there to start the rescue procedure right away. And that happens so often in the agricultural farming industry because farmers do work by themselves. We have employees that work by themselves and it, it's a problem for us. And that's the reason why the numbers on an annual basis uh, have gotten so high. So Sean, you were in construction and then all of a sudden you decided to to uh, make this shoe, you know? So yeah. tell us tell us a little bit about what made you want to do this shoe. And then after the shoe, so many people were asking for uh, steel toed or composite toe. And then now here we are wearing your boots as well. So yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I can tell a little bit about that story. And, and yeah, when it comes to footwear, that's, that's a big one when we're talking about safety and um, you know, and, and we talk to guys all the time, but yeah, I, I work construction. My, my family owned a small home building business and I worked for my dad growing up and when I was younger and, and that's where it kind of kicked, you know, my dad and, and, and the older guys all wore the work boots, the, the heavy construction work boots. And I tried them. Honestly, I couldn't stand them. They were too heavy. My feet were getting hot work in construction. So I'd, I'd always be sneaking and, and wearing my Nikes while, while we were building houses. And my dad would get all mad at me for not wearing my boots. And this went on for years. Um, and then, you know, fast forward a little bit, you know, doing a lot of, you know, doing some landscaping jobs and some yard work. And it, I was in the same boat. I hated wearing the heavy, hot boots. I wanted some light. I wanted to wear my Nikes, but it, it just wasn't working for, for mowing and trimming and everything, you know. Uh, you know, one thing I noticed right away was doing hills when I was mow I was push mowing or doing trimming on hills, especially dewy grass in the morning with with the wrong shoes. I was slipping, you know, and you're you have your equipment, and you start sliding a little bit. That's not a good situation. So the first thing I wanted to do was was create some some really good grip um, on the bottoms of it. And, th and then just the other things, you know, you don't want your feet to get real wet either. And, and I know guys talk about that all the time. It's not necessarily safety. But if you have wet feet all day, that's that's not good for your work environment and, and really isn't isn't safe for your feet. Um, so that's that's kind of why I launched the shoes to start, uh, you know, right there that, you know, that was the main reason to do kind of a, a, a lighter shoe, but had the had the protections needed for mowing and trimming and blowing and all that stuff. Um, but but you're right, Danny. You know, we had the shoe. Everyone loved it, which was great. But a lot of guys said, hey, your shoes. Cool. But I need safety toe, you know, either, you know, a lot of the guys, they just want it for their own protection. And, and I started learning, you know what, this is pretty important. And then other guys, um, it was out of their control. You know, some of the bigger landscape companies, and, and I think it's the right decision. Uh, they have all their employees wear a safety toe, OSHA, OSHA approved or, or pass the rating. So, you know, a lot of these guys are like, hey, I'm not even allowed to wear your shoe unless you give me a safety toe. So, um, so that's when we launched the boot with the safety toe. And, and somebody just asked the question, uh, landscapes by acne, why'd you choose steel over composite? Uh, we actually, it's not steel. It actually is composite. It's the opposite. So yeah. It's the opposite. Yep. So we, we chose composite over steel, um, just based on testing and our research composites, definitely lighter. That's the biggest thing. Um, that's the biggest thing it, it's lighter and, it, and it's just as strong. The composite now it, it passed all the same, uh, impact and compression standards, um, that all the traditional steel toes would pass. Um, and, and it's great. Like, I mean, we had a guy post on Instagram, you know, a few months ago, a picture of his boot, his Cujo boot had a big slice in the front of the material. He said an ax got away from him. He was doing some, some, some chopping with an ax. And he said, if it wasn't for that safety toe, he would have cut his toes right off. So, um, you know, not whether it's our boot or a different boot, you know, it just goes to show firsthand that, um, hey, you can save some toes, save your feet, you know, by, by just doing that. Yeah, because I mean, working in, you know, any industry, the biggest thing I hear from any of these groups is, is what's a good shoe? What's a good boot? I want something comfortable. I've tried everything. Um, and so, I mean, just being out in the heat all day and stuff like that can make you get into bad habits in the workplace as well. And that's going to bring us to Troy over here. Troy, 
the uh, he he did upholstery, guys, and then Troy got into trimming his own yard, and he was looking for something to help out, and here here we have the comfort trims. Uh, so you know, I mean, every one of these guys have owned a business or own a business as of right now as well. So Troy, um, the comfort trim. I mean, tell us a little bit about this. Well, you know, some other products out there and everyone that I've seen or tried or, or heard of people trying to wear, it's like it just goes right against your skin. There's some out there that I've had guys use those umpire shin guards and try those, but then all your leg does, your, your, your leg will sweat. Plus, you got the straps on the back. Uh, with ours, the only thing that even touches your skin is, is what we call the, the comfort band. And it, it's, it's actually de designed to where the way our elastic takes up and bunches up, it actually creates air there. And you don't even ha have to put them on very tight and they stay in, in place. Now on the front, the shield we have, it's really does a really, I would say, um, made to have, you know, a lot of pr protection. There are things out there that would probably, you know, go through it if it hit hard enough a piece of glass. But what we found is, you know, what, what they do is they actually, co they create like a two inch air barrier around your whole leg. So the airflow is there. And on the top edge of them, we even made it narrower on the shield on the front because heat rises. So with that, it lets the heat dissipate more. Plus, we designed it so so that just just with like a walking motion actually creates airflow too. And um, you know, I'm, we're, we're getting uh, we, we get reviews all of the time about guys that the guys just say, you know, uh, finally I found something that that, that works out there. And it's just great, you know, to see that. And you can kind of relate there too, Sean, you know, hearing, hearing all, all the good stuff about your product. But then, of course, you know, we have the haters too. And, you know, you know the people that just that make the awful, you know, is always going to make an awful comment like, well, you know, just wear pants. Well, you know, your wife will love you more if you wear these, if you wear pants, because you're not going to track all that stuff in. And uh, these work great with, with pants as, as well. But, you know, like I said, our main market is for people who wear shorts, and there's a lot of you out there. And uh, we're also getting ready to come out with uh, what we call the Comfort Trim Pro. It'll probably be next year, and it's going to have some added protection on the front. I actually put a pair on in my shop a while back, our test model, and I took a wooden yardstick and I hit it as hard as I could. And I just kept hitting it and hitting it to where if I'd have hit my leg, it'd have been red or bleeding. And it and when I when I took it off, there wasn't even a red mark. And it only adds like a, I think it was just like about eight grams is all to our, our, our product's weight. So uh, we're kind of excited about that. We're gonna do a couple other um, modifications too. We just have to check with our patent attorney just to make sure that that we we stay within our pet guidelines so um danny uh, i i hear that that you wear a comfort trim oh I, I wear everything i wear the cujos the comfort trims <clears throat> like man i tell you what that's that's probably the the best thing uh, that you said about them was i don't have the grass stains uh i don't have the grass stains so when i take my pants off i don't have grass everywhere i don't have grass in my washer uh in the washer filter anymore i don't i don't I mean, when you start talking about fixing a washer compared to the cost of a product to save you from having to do that, well, I mean, it's 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 a no-brainer. You spend 30 bucks, you don't have to worry about it. Yeah, you look a little funny, let's be honest, but it's it's everything is made. I mean, that's why a lot of people stray away from safety stuff is because the way they look, the the, the funny you know, things that, oh, it makes me look crazy or the safety glasses. Um, the the biggest thing with me is is I'm blind out of one eye. I was born that way. So I'm completely blind out of my left eye. And so I really have to watch everything I do. So when I'm trimming wearing glasses that are safety approved or are my number one thing, because one wrong move, I'm blind out of both eyes. Uh, you know, I don't have one to, to spare. So, um, 
and and once again it comes down to oh you know what i'm just going to jump out of the truck real quick and and trim around this tree that i missed and then that's the one time you forget to put your safety glasses on that's also the one time something happens to be there a piece of bark pops off the tree and boom right in the eye and now you know now what um so always always i mean we take so much for granted uh being in this um so I, I, I do have another question and I'm kind of curious on this because let's say I have employees, Sam, um, uh, regardless of company, I'm a, let's say I'm a big company, a, a small company, whatever. Should I, I mean, is it, is it my uh, responsibility to provide the, the work gear? Like, should I provide their safety glasses, their, their headphones, their boots, or should I provide part of that and say, hey, you go buy your own your own boots? Um, how, how should that work? Okay, well, it's, it's a little bit of a complex uh, response to your question. Uh, the employer is responsible for providing the personal protective equipment or the PPE that's needed to do the job. The exceptions are steel-toed boots are not a required purchase by the employer for the employee. It may be a good idea to uh, provide those that kind of footwear, but the employer is not required to, to provide or purchase uh, steel-toed boots. Uh, eyewear, you mentioned uh, eyewear. Uh, it is the responsibility of the employer to provide ANSI approved, uh, what's called Z, uh, Z is in zoo, 87.1 glasses. And if you wonder if they are uh, glasses that are ANSI approved, if you look on the inside of the stem right here, you'll see a capital Z with an 87.1. And then sometimes there would be a year, 2017, that would represent the last year that standard was upgraded. Hearing protection is required. Uh, you said something, it's earplugs or ear muffs. Uh, even though OSHA does not, um, uh, th does not, well, first of all, I guess the best way to say it is OSHA does not suggest that you wear a headset with a radio and so forth on it, simply because an individual maybe can't hear uh, somebody trying to give them instructions, for example. Uh, for companies that do have those, usually it's a crew manager or crew leader. And it may be they have them on because they're waiting to hear about, say, severe weather that may be in the area. So the home office is trying to get in touch with them and saying, we've got severe weather coming. Probably need to get your employees out of the field uh, and into a protected area because of the thunder and lightning and things that are coming. But PPE is the requirement of the employer. Uh, that's been clarified any number of times by directives from Federal OSHA. And uh, uh, the exception to providing additional PPE, let's say you had an employee who is really abusing their eyewear, their hearing protection, uh, you can give them a warning. And if the employee continues to just abuse the PPE you're providing, you can make a pretty good case for having them pay for the second, third, or fourth pair if they're damaging the, the other ones and they're not following proper storage or maintenance procedures. So I think that kind of answers your questions about PPE. It is the employer's responsibility. And you, the PPE that's required would be the PPE that's based on your hazard assessment or hazard audit of the workplace where there's loud noise, flying debris from underneath mower decks and those kinds of things. And when you have that kind of assessment that determines the hazards exist, then the PPE has to be provided. So on this same subject, uh, I've got to ask. So let's say, because uh, I'm curious about this, an employee shows up to work one day without the proper PPE and he gets injured. But you're you're a big company, so you're really not, you know, none of the, let's say it was your head guy maybe that was out doing a job by himself. He gets injured uh, from not using the proper PPE is there a is that strictly all on the employee is that on him or does that come back on the company uh as well i mean it's their employee so i would assume it was but how does how does something like that exactly work he was provided with the proper stuff he's been using the proper stuff anytime you're around but you know once again let's jump out of the truck real quick trim around this tree type of thing 
uh, he just goes to do something real quick, ends up getting hurt. What, what happens now? Well, I, I have two suggestions. Number one, the personal protective equipment that's been assigned to that worker should be kept either in the work vehicle or at least close to the job site. I, I would not support uh, your employees taking their PPE home. My disclaimer there is, however, during COVID-19, uh, a lot of the companies were having their employees go directly from their homes right to the work sites. They knew where the work was going to be that day. So that kept a lot of individuals uh, more than you should have individuals in the work vehicles riding to a job site. So if you had employees that were willing to drive to the job site in their own personal vehicle, it probably means they're probably carrying their own PPE uh, in the vehicle. So what you need to think about with PPE is keep it as close to the workplace as possible. If in fact you want them to leave it uh, in the work vehicles, make sure you provide something like a sealable plastic bag and it has their name on the outside of it. And so they put their earplugs, their earmuffs, their uh, safety glasses in that particular one because really right now you don't want them use, sharing PPE anyway. So you do want to have especially a, uh, workers specially assigned their PPE. And uh, so keeping it as close to the job site as possible, right where they can put it on. And if in fact uh, the key to all of them on that crew wearing that PPE is probably the crew leader or the crew manager. And if they see somebody that's out there and there's a crew and let's say they've got a couple zero turn operators, uh, the debris, the grass clippings and anything they run over is flying out the end of the deflector shield and it hits somebody in the eye and you have a, a claim where somebody suffers a serious eye injury or God forbid they lose an eye, OSHA will probably do a, an inspection. Uh, they do inspections when there's an amputation They'll probably do an inspection when there's a loss of an eye, and they certainly will do an inspection if, God forbid, there's a fatality. And you have just a certain number of hours to report those things to OSHA, or that's a violation. So make sure that your uh, uh, crew managers, the crew leaders, the individuals that are out there are enforcing your policies on personal protective equipment. And if they can't get somebody to do it, somebody in human resources or in senior management needs to take that employee aside and say, look, you have to wear it. And you had said something earlier, I just want to uh, mention to you, uh, personal protective eyewear, that's safety eyewear that meets the new ANSI standards has come a long way in the last 10 to 20 years. It used to be you had to wear goggles, they would sweat, they were uncomfortable, uh, goggles were terrible and employees resisted them. I know when I was in the business, my employees never wanted to wear goggles with a tight band around the back. But uh, PPE eyewear, protective eyewear today has come a long way. It's more stylish. It gives you peripheral protection, gives you ultraviolet protection and impact resistance on the lenses. And uh, it's much more suitable and much more desirable by the employees to wear the new uh, better designed uh, eyewear today. So that was, that was a good example because uh, we did a little study when I was working in the Chicago area. We got five landscape companies to try the new eyewear that met the ANSI standards and the employees loved it versus what they thought. They wanted to wear their aviator sunglasses, something that looked like aviator glasses. And uh, a lot of those don't are glass lenses. So if something hits those glass lenses, it'll shatter and you've got an employee with some serious eye injuries. So uh, the new styles are much more acceptable for the employees and that's the way to go. And they're not that expensive. Yeah, you can get them pretty cheap at Walmart even. Um, yeah. I mean, there's there's so many places to get eyewear. I mean, you can buy it by the case. Uh, go to Amazon. Ta-da! You know, <laughs> find what you like. Sean, how many do you you've got this warehouse where you run your cujos out of ship them and things of that? How many employees do you have? Is it just family members? I mean, I, I guess that's still employees. But um, yeah. what do you do as far as workplace safety to make sure everybody's doing what they do inside the warehouse? I mean, you're, you're helping us be safe. But I mean, what do you do to, to help your people stay safe? Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. So actually, yeah, so it's, uh, you know, it is a family owned business. You kind of brought that up. So we have, you know, my sister and a few others, you know, we all started this together and, and, you know, we have a handful of employees now. Our warehouse is actually, we don't own our warehouse, so we have a partner. Um, it's, it's another small family owned uh, warehouse based out of Toledo, Ohio. So uh, I'm not directly responsible for that, but, you know, I've been in there and, and you know, the owner, you know, she has all, all the OSHA requirements and the safety things for all the warehouse employees. But again, they're not technically my employees. So, yeah. So anything you need, uh, I mean, any, <clears throat> everybody knows working for anybody. Um, when you work for a big place, whenever you start going through uh, the beginning steps of being part of that business, one of the main things and first things that they do is they show you where I wash stations are first aid yeah. kits, sick fire right. extinguishers. Um, I mean, should should all businesses stem, uh, Sam? Sorry, should all businesses have a written uh, policy per se? And OSHA requires uh, that you have a written safety and health program, and that program is based upon the hazards that your employees could be exposed to, not just in your shop, not just in your distribution yard, not just in the offices, but that, that assessment or audit of hazards needs to also be done on the work sites, the different kinds of work sites that you have. For example, uh, here in Pennsylvania, there's not a flat lot of flat areas. So a lot of the landscape sites here have pretty significant slopes. Uh, they may have a water retention area like a pond or a stream. Uh, typically, Florida has a lot of those types of properties with water that's uh, part of the property. That be, needs to become part of the hazard assessment that's done. And all of that's written up then, and your training that you do deals with the hazards that you found. And the, if you had an incident and you are inspected by an OSHA inspector, they will ask you probably number one, after they've ad properly identified themselves, they're gonna ask you to look at your written safety and health program. And it always ends up on the list of 10 most often cited violations in our industry. It's always in the top 10 where the uh, company or the firm can't provide a written safety and health program. That's a violation. And when you look at what the, the fines can be, First time fine for us, that's considered a serious violation, not having a written safety and health program. The fine can be over $13,600 first time fine if you don't have that written safety and health program. So Danny, you're right. I mean, you do need to have all of that in writing. And then after you do the training, one thing that companies tend to forget if you've trained a group of employees on whatever it is, let's say it's uh, on proper wearing of a respirator, for example, because you're doing some cutting of paver blocks and there's a chance for that respirable silica dust to be in the air. If you're doing that type of thing, you need, first of all, to have the respiratory policy and part of your written safety and health program, how to fit test the respirator and how to do all of that thing. But after you've done the training, please make sure that you document everybody that was trained, have them sign a sheet. Uh, what you've got is a sheet that says, here's the topic, here was the instructor, and here all of them sign it. On this day, I was trained and say it's a, it could be a lunchbox type training, could be a tailgate training, or it could be your weekly training at the office before the crews go out. The most important thing to do is document all of that training you did. Because if you don't have documentation of it, it's your word against theirs. So how often should you should you be updating this? Should you be reviewing it with your employees? Like, let's say that you've got the same employees uh, that you've had, like nothing's changed. But how often should you go over the same same stuff with them? I mean, I know this is a serious thing, but how often would should somebody go over this and how often should they update their books. I mean, I, I would assume when you get something new in the workplace, a chemical or something, if you're spraying pesticides or whatever, there should be a safety sheet on that. Right, a new safety data sheet. And uh, the other, there's a couple answers to that question, uh, Danny. Number one, when you have new employees, 
They should really be trained before they go out on the job, before they're involved in a job where there may be some of those hazards that you already identified. Let's say, for example, you take on a new job and this job requires that you do some, let's say you've decided to do some tree work. So you have a certified arborist that comes to work for you because it looks like a good way to expand a good solid landscape business because there's a lot of tree work available in your area. When you take on a new job, you probably need to do uh, training, retraining because the, the new job, the new work environment may have other hazards that the other jobs didn't have. So you want to make sure new employees get trained early on so that the training may have to be done. You may want to do some more training when new job sites come on board. And then if you've got a, 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 some type of occurrence that keeps happening over and over again, let's say it's a, what we call close calls. When you start seeing a lot of close calls, that means that you need to do some training in that particular area because a close call is going to become your next major claim your next major incident which is like uh the boards you see at some of these places this is zero days without accident uh two close calls and you know whatever how many uh so troy did upholstery um for years i mean that's that's what he's done and your hands are real close to needles uh do they make gloves for that or i mean how does how does that work you're muted. Unmute yourself. Well, I haven't found any gloves. And you know, you would think uh, as much as I sew every day on a daily basis that I would have at least sewed my finger once, but knock on wood, I actually haven't. Yeah, that's that's great. Do they make gloves for, for uh something like that i mean it, it would almost have to be a thimble type or something steel because that that, that needle's coming at a pretty fast with a behind about a three-quarter horse and uh, that needle's very sharp so i would probably say no about the biggest hazard that that i have in the upholstery shop would would probably be like working with the, the, the razor blades cutting seams apart on the things that that we work on in there hmm that's yeah because some of them needles can get pretty big yes they can wow does anybody uh have any questions uh sean troy sam does do y'all have any anything to put in ask any of these guys or you know hey maybe there's something you're curious about Well, Sean, uh, you and I are kind of in, in about the same kind of business. And uh, I think we I'd like to get together once in a while with sometime and <laughs> maybe get on the phone. We could probably help each other out with with things that, that, that we've learned. And I'm sure you're going to be at GIE. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'd love to get together. And I'm sure uh, hopefully a lot of the people watching this will be at GIE, too, because uh, that's such a great event. So yeah, we'll, we'll definitely be there and, and, yep. and uh, see a lot of people there. Yep. Well, we're going to have some, some, some giveaways there too. We're going to, we're going to give away a one of a kind uh, pair of, of comfort trim. We're going to have a drawing for it and they're going to be like a, a, a special edition. Uh, we're going to call it the, the freedom edition. It's going to be an Eagle grasp and a flag. So that's going to be kind of cool. Um, we're going to have some lanyards, there too, uh, to attach your comfort trim to your your uh, your trimmer, and uh, uh, it's it's just going to be fun. You know, I really missed it last year. GIE is going to be great. I can't wait. They better yeah. not cancel. I'll be so mad. <laughs> <laughs> so before we end this, uh, Sam, you specifically take a lot of questions from people that are members of the the national association of landscape professionals um can you tell the people out there that could be interested how they could join this and possibly the cost well nalp has a uh, uh website uh we have a huge uh, group of resources dedicated to safe worker safety and health uh, we have what's called the Safe Company Program, just kind of give you a background on all the different safety resources. 
I'm one of the safety resources uh, for members, but you can go to the uh, NALP website and we have obviously a membership office and you can contact them and they can give you uh, all the information about joining the National Association. I think the last time I asked somebody at the uh, home office, uh, in, in the home office, how many people we had, I think we had, I'm going to say seven or 8,000 members across the country. And those seven or 8,000 members, I even went a little bit further and I, the information then, but it's been a while, this was probably just be as COVID was starting. So it's been over a year. Uh, those uh, seven to 8,000 members represented 200,000 or so uh, green industry workers across the country. So we really make a determined effort at safety and health at member benefits and GIC, uh, the uh, meeting in Louisville is exceptional. Uh, I'm not sure yet whether I'm going this year, but if I do, I certainly want to meet Sean and I want to see Troy there and uh, get a really close hands-on look at the products that they've got. Because I do get a lot of questions about those types of things, what, especially in the footwear area. I get a lot of questions about footwear and, uh, and teaching the OSHA 10-hour course to our industry people. That question comes up every time from multiple people. And we taught the course online on a uh, uh, with an online platform this past uh, six to twelve months, and we had almost three or four hundred people come online this winter just to take that OSHA ten hour course. So that's something else to keep in mind that uh, NALP sponsors, and it's uh, it's not all that expensive, and it works really well for the larger companies who have. 10, 20, 30, maybe even 40 employees they want to put through the program. And once COVID kind of eases off, I'll be going out and doing those. Uh, uh, I do a lot of training here on the East Coast, and we have two certified trainers out in the West Coast, three certified trainers on the West Coast. So that's another one of our uh, resources that would be a big benefit to a person that is either a member of NALP or somebody that's thinking about it or somebody that's not a member of NALP. All right, this next question I've got to ask is for Sean or Troy, either one of you, both of you feel free to answer. Hey, the more the merrier, right? Uh, so what is the return of investment of buying proper PPE? So, uh, you know, in other words, what what's it cost a business can face for lost time or employees? Yeah, I mean, that's a that's a good question. And I mean, it's certainly there, like you said, um, you know, speaking to, to footwear, you know, specifically, I mean, we talked to so many guys where, um, you know, guys are out of commission, like, you know, if, if they don't, they don't have their shoes or their boots, like, they literally feel like they're, I mean, I talk to these guys all the time, you know, if they had an issue with their boots or their shoes, or let's say one of our, you know, the safety toe boots got lost in the shipment, you know, they're they're concerned that their productivity is going to be way down and 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 it is and and it happens all the time so i mean it, you know there's there's two ways to look at it one is is just the product productivity for having the right gear and, and going out there every day um and then you know like you said the potential for injury which you know sam touched on earlier whether it's shoes or any other gear i mean you you know <laughs> Well, I think one of the biggest challenges in this industry right now is is uh, hiring good help. I think we can all agree on that. Like if, if you got some if you got a good crew and you got some good, reliable employees, that's gold right now. And the last thing you want is to lose one or two of these guys do for an injury or this or that. And, and, and if and if you whatever you can do to reduce that risk of losing your good guys, I mean, you, you can't even put money on that. Right. Troy, do you have anything to add? Yeah, you know, I mean, as of, you know, cost in that and, and losing out like in 2020 uh, during the COVID, our, our Amazon sales were actually up. We, we, we did good there. We just, you know, wasn't atten able to attend any of the trade shows and the trade shows are fairly expensive anyway. You can, Sean can probably relate to me with, with me on that. And, but, you know, we're kind of facing something a little different right now. Our, our comfort trims have been made overseas, I, I hate to say. The main reason is, is, you know, I've run a business for, for decades and I wanted my life to get easier. I didn't want to start a manufacturing facility. I wanted to pick up the phone, 
call it in, it come in on a in a shipment, in a container, boom, done. But unfortunately, uh, that has changed due to things going on in the world and on the other side of the world. Um, we, we was getting ready to call in an order just uh, two weeks ago to, uh, uh, to Hong Kong. We already had all the arrangements, everything done. And we thought, well, you know, we, we got to have some shipping costs. And what used to cost about $3,500 to get our stuff here to the mainland is now $38,000. So I just, I just told my man, manufacturer, I said, even if you make them force for, we're still going to lose money on it. So you guys are kind of the first to hear, but uh, we've already found a facility. Um, we got materials on the way. Comfort trims are going to be now made in America. Uh, we're going to go ahead and do it ourselves. Uh, so that's, that's going to be good. I'm going to be glad to be able to put all the, the American flag on the wrapper on the, the cover now and put my flag over the uh, table at the shows. So then you'll be, you'll be right there with the OSHA books and all that stuff in the warehouse now. So, so now it's, uh, right. now it's all on you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, what's kind of nice, what's really nice about that is now, you know, we're going to, I'm going to be in control to where if we want to come out with another color or do like a limited edition, we're already going to be coming out, I think, next spring with what we're calling the Caribbean Blue for for sure. And now to where we're going to be doing the printing and everything else on them, it's just going to to make it easier for us just to do as many as we want to run ourselves. And I also noticed there was a question here. Somebody's asked uh, me, what is the best breathable material to look for in drinking outside in the heat all day? You know, I'm not a clothing expert, but I will say this. When I was growing up for 15 years, I, my dad and I grew a, a 80 acre truck garden, vegetable garden. And my job, because my dad, bless his soul, um, he didn't want to hire no help. He had me. So my job was to hold that, uh, all the weeds in that for three months. And then after three months, then we picked it all. And that took three, three months in, in our harvest. So I found the coolest thing I could find to wear was just the thinnest cotton t-shirt I could, if, if that helps. So there you go. I, I'm a polyester type myself. Sean, you, you found anything that's nice and breathable? And we're, uh, yeah, we're, we're actually testing materials on, uh, for some pants right now. For, to, we're going to do some landscaping pants for next year, and, and that's a key thing we're looking for. It's got to got to have the protection. And now, Troy, you don't like the pants. I apologize where I'm going with this one. <laughs> um, uh, it, you know, it needs to have the protection, but it's got to be light and comfortable. So, yeah, we're, we're, we're testing materials now. It's a great question. Is this going to come in big boy size? Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, but Sean, Sean you, can, you can make them as comfortable as you want, but, you know, they're still going to get messy. Yeah. Yep, totally agree. And, 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 you know, I think it goes back to, you know, what you mentioned with your product is there's no one size fits all for this industry. I mean, you're going to have some crews where everybody's wearing pants. And then it, even if you think that's the right thing, you're going to have other crews where these guys wear shorts because it's too hot, especially down south. You know, I'm in Carolina or you get down in Florida. Um, right. in, in, Carolina. In, in, and you could also say everybody should wear safety toe boots all the time. <laughs> Well, the reality is a lot of people like to wear their sneakers. Mm -hmm. So that's where, you know, you, you can't say everybody has to do everything, but you got to at least still look at safety and look at protection. And instead of just a sneaker, what's at least a little better? What what protects me a little more? You know what I mean? Instead of just wearing shorts, you know, let's let's get Troy's product and, and have a little more safety here. So I think there's no one size fits all. I think everybody's got to assess their situation, their region, the type of work they're doing and then just get the and just think about it and be smart pants i can't wait this is gonna be awesome i guess for all you big boys out there be watching pants coming soon <clears throat> well and, and sean um I don't, I don't know if this will help you or not and i didn't mention this but i've got a model right here and part of our patented design is on this uh this comfort band right here and i don't know if this will help you out with maybe designing your pants or whatever but you know if it does it does but <laughs> We, we, we have built in a cuff up here to where wherever this ride it's our product rides on the top of one of your shoes 
um, then it just cuffs up. If you have a, a shorter leg, it'll just start going up, uh, up, up to two inches. If you have a longer leg, it just, just rides all, all the way down. So, you know, feel free to run with that if you want. <laughs> That's very cool. Very cool design. All right, guys, thank you to all who have joined us live tonight and a special thank you to our panelists. I appreciate uh, y'all for taking the time to come up here and speak on this subject with us. Mark your calendars. Our next pro networking event will happen live right here on YouTube in two weeks. We go live every second Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern time or that is 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. Until then, you can check out Echo Means Business for the exact dates and topics. Remember, you can watch this recording or any of the other networking sessions on Echo Community, or you can listen to it on the Echo Means Business podcast. Visit echomeansbusiness.com now and register for your free access to great content, contest, and make great connections with people like me. Right. So thank you all for being here. We will see you in two weeks. Thank you, awesome. Danny. Yeah, thanks, guys. Thanks, Danny. Thanks, everybody. Nice to meet you guys. Yeah. See you around. <laughs>